first of all, I am thankful to INS. I am honored that Dr. Chidaram, Dr. Grover, my guide, Anil, uh, uh, Anand Saab, and so many senior colleagues are here. Outline of the talk is, first I will talk about the nuclear non-proliferation and its link with the safeguards. Then a little about safeguards activities in Indian facilities. Then I will talk about new safeguards measures. Now these measures that I talk about, some of them have been taken from the literature and some of most of them come from my experience in working with my team. We were respond my team was responsible for designing the fuel fabrication plant for FRHCF, that is for the uh, prototype fast builder reactor. And we were also involved in the design of thorium-based fuel cycle facilities. So th those uh, things that I uh, talk about, they mainly come from that. And then I will also talk about the link between civil nuclear cooperation agreements and safeguards, for which we have Dr. Grover here, history sitting here, and of course Dr. Chidambaram also, who have been very intimately uh, involved how the uh, various different agreements were negotiated. Uh, very simple to start with, all of us know about it, so I will not explain much about it. And then of course this is how the chain reaction goes. Now, let us talk about the three fissile materials, though most of us know, but still I will repeat. See, we start with thorium-232, which is a fertile material, and then upon uh, neutron irradiation, it converts to uranium-233, which becomes fissile. Similarly, we have uranium-235, which is naturally fissile material, and then we have uranium-238, which upon irradiation becomes plutonium-239. I will not go to the uh, equations and to the cycle. Most of you know how it happens. Now, role of heavy water, this also most of you know, but I will still repeat. See, natural uranium, fissions in presence of heavy water. Heavy water is a moderator that effectively slows down the neutrons and heavy water is essential for such type of reactors like pressurized heavy water reactors in India. Then we have enriched uranium up to 3 to 5 percent with fissions in the presence of light water. Light water is used for such reactors but the fuel needed is enriched uranium. This is the kind of reactors that we have Tarapur 1 and 2 and of course the uh, VVR type of reactors. Essentially, our three-stage nuclear power program, I will just go over. Now, this is a fuel cycle, starting from natural miling, conversion, enrichment, fuel fabrication, power, generation, spent fuel storage, and reprocessing. Now, once through uh, fuel cycle stops at spent fuel storage, it doesn't go to reprocessing or refabrication. India follows a closed nuclear fuel cycle where the spent fuel goes to the reprocessing, then of course those things, there would be a stage of refabrication and introduction into a next generation of reactors. Very simple reactor basics, how the heat is generated and how it is converted into energy. This is something sensitive. Now let us talk about the relation between the nuclear fuel cycle and also the weapons. This, if you are familiar with, this is a live, uh, this is a full-scale model of Little Boy. I was privileged to be trained at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in 2011. There is a museum at Oak Ridge National Laboratory where these have been displayed. Now, this was the device which was dropped at Hiroshima. This was based on high enriched uranium. Now, it was famously called the Little Boy. This is a plaque from the museum. During World War II, the White Well plant processed uranium for an atomic bomb. The bomb called the Little Boy weighed about 9,000 pounds. It had a diameter of 28 inches and it was 120 inches long. Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan on August 6, 1945. A second atomic bomb was dropped on another Japanese city, Nagasaki, three days later. The Japanese surrendered on August 15, 1945. Now, at that time, see you saw the model, you saw the first one, the little boy, that was based on low enriched uranium. At that point of time, the most popular method for enrichment of uranium was 
gaseous diffusion. And in fact, this is a photograph of one of the gaseous diffusion pumps that is displayed in that museum. Now, currently what is used for enrichment is gaseous centrifuge. Now, a little bit about the uranium. Now you see the first one up there, that is natural uranium. Most of us know that it contains uranium-235 in the range of 0.72. Then the lower one, middle one is low enriched uranium. This is up to 3 to 4 percent. The cutoff limit for LEU is 20 percent. And then you have the high enriched uranium, which is more than 90 percent. And this, this particular slide has been made some time back. If I were to do this slide once again today, maybe I would like to in introduce one more circle which will be close to about 20% because these days we are talking about small and modular reactors. The fuel being talked about for small and modular reactors is close to about 20%, but it is below 20%. Now, very briefly, what happens in a gaseous, diffuse, uh, gaseous centrifuge? Uranium, uranium hexafluoride is introduced in a rotating, uh, there is a rotor, the uranium-235 and uranium-238, 235 is lighter, 238 is heavier because of the centrifuge. The uranium-235 at very high speed, it concentrates towards the center and on the periphery you have 238. This is a single centrifuge but there are cascades of centrifuge so that after multiple cascades you, you achieve the enrichment that you desire. This is the photograph taken from the internet of one of the centrifuges. This is another one. Uranium hexafluoride is transported and stored in canisters like this. Now let us talk about, we talked about the low enriched uranium weapon that was the uh, little boy or uranium-235. The other one was Nagasaki, this, this is called the fat map. This is based on the plutonium. This was once again photograph taken from that museum. This is the reactor at Oak Ridge, graphite reactor, where uranium was irradiated and then plutonium was separated out of that uh, spent fuel and then it was used to make the Nagasaki device, the plutonium. Now, just to give you an idea, some of you are from reprocessing. I don't have to explain much. So, if you see the spent fuel, what is the constituent of the spent fuel? So, this is what you actually are the uh, constituents. And of importance, from weapons point of view, is the 0.9% plutonium. Just to give you an idea, many of you would have seen this thing. This is a uh, view of a spent fuel storage bay. Now, let us now come to what is proliferation resistance. Why did I show you those Nagasaki, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Because they are linked to the nuclear fuel cycle. One comes from the enrichment of uranium, that is uranium-235. Second thing, that comes from the reprocessing of the spent fuel, that is the plutonium. That is why you would have heard a term called ENR, that is enrichment and reprocessing technologies. They are sensitive because those two roots of enrichment of uranium-235 and reprocessing of spent fuel gives you plutonium which can be diverted to make nuclear weapon device. Now, what is proliferation resistance? As per the de definition, proliferation resistance is that characteristic of a nuclear energy system that impedes the diversion or undeclared production of nuclear material. We talked about nuclear material, it was uranium-235, uranium-233 and plutonium-239. Or misuse of technology, enrichment and reprocessing by states in order to acquire nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. This is the definition of prolif uh, proliferation resistance. Now there are two types of proliferation resistance. One is intrinsic, that is intrins inherent to a particular fuel cycle system and depends on scientific characteristics of fissile material. We talk about the thorium, thorium fuel cycle because of the uranium-232 which has very hard hitting gamma, it is called inherently intrinsic property of the fuel. So that is called the intrinsic proliferation resistance. 
So another one is extrinsic. This is when you use the technological measures or you also use the administrative measures to achieve <coughs> the purpose of nuclear non-proliferation. Now, what is nuclear material? Nuclear material refers to the metals, uranium, plutonium, and thorium in any form. Now, this is different, differentiated further into source material consisting of natural and depleted uranium and special fissionable material consisting of enriched uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Uranium ore concentrates are considered to be source material, although they are not subjected to safeguards. Now, there is a term called significant quantities of fissile material. Now, these are the significant quantities for direct use nuclear material, plutonium is 8 kgs, uranium-233 is 8 kgs, and high enriched uranium, that is uranium-235 greater than 20 percent, is 25 kg of uranium-235. Now, indirect use nuclear material is uh, uranium, which is 235 less than the LEU. Now, this is significant quantity. Now, significant quantity is the approximate amount of nuclear material for which the possibility of manufacturing a nuclear explosive device cannot be excluded. Significant quantities take into account unavoidable, unavoidable losses due to conversion and ma manufacturing processes and are distinct from critical masses. Here I will just tell you, when we come to the how safeguards are implemented by IAEA, it, see the IEA visits of inspectors are based on the significant quantity. They have to, in a timely manner, find out that there is no diversion by the state. So here I will make a comment right here. When we talk about SMRs, which are the new kind of reactors which we are talking about today, they will come in the range of up to 20%, where the fuel close to very 20%, uranium-235. What this would imply is that the visit to an SMR facility will be mandated more frequently by the IEA safeguards inspectors, which will be a load on the safeguards activity of the IEA sec uh, secretary. Sir, now, just sir, to give you... Sir, it includes thorium also. Which one? 20 ton of thorium. Yes, 20 ton of thorium. So, what it says that when you have 20 tons of thorium, it is a significant quantity which can be converted into uranium uh, uh, and then which can be diverted for making a nuclear explosive device. So the safeguards, they are based on significant quantity. These are different from critical mass. International nuclear safeguards play an essential role to help ensure that nuclear materials are not used to make weapons. Now what are the various uh, attributes of uh, uh, nuclear weapon, there is a testing, there is a delivery system, arming, fire, firing and fusing systems, technical know-how, high explosives and nuclear material. Now safeguards concentrate, concentrate only on the nuclear material. It does not take into account and the other parts that you see in this particular figure. Now, the International Atomic Energy, IAEA, both promotes and safeguards Atomic energy for peaceful uses. This was created in 1957 by a statute of the IAEA. It is affiliated to the United Nations. The objective, the objective is to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, health, and prosperity throughout the world. As of today, 178 member states are there, which participate in formulating agency policies, are eligible for technical assistance in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and share the cost of its operation. Now, IEA safeguards. Now, IEA safeguard, they are done for nuclear material or facility is used for peaceful purpose. This is the objective of the safeguards. Now, very important thing, very, very many people have this uh, uh, doubt or confusion that it is only the nuclear material. No. Once a facility is under safeguards, even the facility cannot be used for any other purpose. I'll give you an example. Like India has placed several several of its own in uh, Indian built pressurized heavy water reactors on IEA safeguards. For example, we have Rajasthan 3 and 4, Rajasthan 5 and 6, we have Narora and we have uh, Kaida. Even the recently put reactors also. One, can, one may think that since this reactor is built by India, can I now not put an Indian fuel bundle, Indian made and then uh, irradiate it 
and then separate it and uh, you uh, take off plutonium? No, it is not, totally not permitted. Both the nuclear material as well as the facility which is under IAS safeguards. Now, the technical objective of international nuclear safeguards is the timely detection of diversion of significant quantities of nuclear material from peaceful nuclear activities to the manufacture of nuclear weapons or of other nuclear explosive device or for purpose unknown and deterrence of such diversion by risk of early detection. This is by definition what is the aim of the IAA safeguards and that is why it depends on significant quantities and not on other figures. This is taken from Information Circular 153. By the way, I think 153 refers to Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. Now, how are nuclear safeguards applied internationally? See, the safeguards agreement required by a variety of agreements provide the legal context for international nuclear safeguards. Now, there are host of agreements across the world which are the guiding principles for application of nuclear safeguards. Most, uh, uh, it starts from statute of IAEA 1957, then United Nations also is part of the process, URATM, ABACC is Argentina and Brazil, they have a organization. There are regional agreements, Flatco, Raratonga, Palindaba, so these countries like for example, they are uh, regions of Latin America and the Caribbean, the first one, then you have Australia and New Zealand, then you have the African nation. Now there are agreements, regional agreements where the countries which are signed, they are under obligation not to violate those, uh, you know, uh, those provisions in those agreements. Then there is a, when we come to the other one, there is a safeguards agreement. For India, there is a very popular one, Information Circular 754, Dr. Grover is here. I think he was the, one of the main negotiators, am I right sir? Yeah. So, then you have subsidiary uh, arrangements, that means under the umbrella agreement, I will talk about it when I talk about the safeguards, how they are implemented in India. Then there is a thing called subsidiary arrangement, then there are facility attachments. So these are the legal documents and of course NPT is also listed, though we are not a, uh, India is not a signatory to NPT. Now these are the various legal documents under the provisions of which the IAA safeguards are implemented. Now, the IAA announces a safeguard conclusion annually but cannot enforce compliance. This is very important. Every year, somewhere around March, if I remember correctly, for every country, the IAA gives a statement. Uh, like, first one is for comprehensive safeguards agreement. This is for those countries which are treated as nuclear non-weapon state under the NPT. The statement looks like this. The all declared nuclear material in these states have has remained in peaceful nuclear activities or has been otherwise adequately accounted for. So this is sort of giving a statement, let us say a country X, at the end of the year, at the end of the conclusion based on the nuclear material accounting reports and also on the visits made by the IAEA safeguards inspectors that this is the conclusion made for the particular country. Now, data collected by the IEA as part of its independent verification are safeguard confidential and not shared openly. Like a statement made for India, the data collected for India will not be shared with any other country. Then the IEA, now this is very important, the IEA does not have the authority to inform, enforce safeguards obligation. So now what it can do? The IAA can decide to withhold any provision of technical assistance to a non-compliant member state. Now, under the IAA program, there are so many uh, technical cooperation programs that take place. Now, first thing that IAA can do is, IAA can decide to withhold the technical cooperation with that particular country. That is the first step. Now, second is the IAA can refer the cases of non-compliance to the United Nations Security Council. Now, UNSC has the power to take military or other or sanctions or other actions against a particular state based on the recommendation of the IAEA. Individual states can use the IAEA conclusion in making political decisions. For example, 
we always say and we are very proud to say for india that india has never been found to be in violation of any of its safeguards agreement am i right sir so that this particular statement or this particular sentiment was also used while negotiating the indo us nuclear deal and subsequently the uh, uh, that waiver safeguards agreement and also the waiver for the uh, nsc nsc now in case of india what we follow is called the facility or item specific safeguards agreement type 66 this is 153 i think earlier i listed it and this is type 66 meaning what like in case of india india on its own sovereign decision decides which reactor to place under iia safeguards for those reactors which india has constructed but the reactors which come under international collaboration or sourced from outside for example tarapur 1 and 2 rajasthan 1 and 2 kudankulam 1 to 6 they have to be essentially put under iia safeguards so okay coming back to this thing non compliance the inspectors shall report any non compliance to the director general who shall thereupon transmit the report to the board of governors here i may add dr chitambaram was one time chairman of the board of governors am i right sir now the board shall call upon the recipient state or states to remedy for with any non compliance which which it finds to have occurred and the board shall report the non compliance to all members and to the security council and general assembly of the united nations that is why if i remember correctly after the uh, iaea uh, meeting in september immediately after that there is a united nations uh, uh, meeting where Uh, the report of ie is submitted to general conference general conference now what are the key elements international nuclear safeguards are a fundamental pillar of the non proliferation regime they continue to play an important role in curbing the spread of nuclear weapons safeguards require international cooperation and a legal framework for implementation a variety of technical tools is enable safeguards to provide accountancy and continuity of knowledge of nuclear material and challenges to the international safeguards regime have led to major but evolutionary improvements this i think is reference to the traditional protocol 540 which happened after few states were found to be not in uh, following the safeguards agreement now what are the aims of safeguards there is a political aim and there is a technical aim political aim is to verify compliance with safeguards agreement and technical aim is timely detection of diversion of safeguarded nuclear material and of undeclared nuclear material and nuclear assemblies and deterrence through risk of early detection now facilities which are normally covered by safeguards nuclear reactors fuel fabrication plants reprocessing plants storage plants and different plants in nuclear reactor see basically now now you look at it this way that we are focusing on nuclear material aspect only in a nuclear reactor where is the nuclear material in a fresh fuel storage vault reactor core and in the spent fuel storage bay in fuel fabrication plants it is a stores fuel fabrication areas finished and storage area and reprocessing plants in irradiated fuel storage bays reprocessing cells conversion cells uranium and plutonium storage area and of course there are storage plants and enrichment plants now safeguards methods now what are the safeguards methods the basic verification method used by the iaea are <coughs> nuclear material accountancy now it is uh, a requirement is to submit monthly reports verification during periodic visits by iaea inspectors when i talked about the significant quantity the frequency of a visit to a facility is decided by the amount of significant material contained in that particular facility for example i'll tell you a uh, facility which is storing let us say plutonium in the form of oxide will have more visits rather than a facility which is storing only u308 in drums similarly uranium at now the uranium is reported to a level of kilogram and plutonium is reported up to a gram level this is the accuracy that is demanded by the safeguards nuclear material accountancy then second one is the containment and surveillance measures 
sir, how do we define the facility? Like, if I have a facility in construction, or one in industrial sector, or another in Mandala, are they counted as different facilities, See, or even partially separated? This building and the next building. There are two like, things. Sorry, there are two things. One is called a facility, and one is called a location of such facility. Now, a storage plant where you are not converting or making or fabricating anything will be treated as a storage facility. For example, would be a away from the reactor facility. That would be a storage facility. It will uh, stop storage. It will not be called a facility. Facility will be something like a reactor where the nuclear fuel is being irradiated. Facility is also a reprocessing plant. It is also a fuel fabrication plant. Now, we come to the surveillance systems. Cameras for implant imagery as well as satellite imagery using geostationary st satellites help in detecting undeclared movement of cars, containers holding nuclear material in locations such as reactor wards, spent fuel pools, vehicle airlocks, and train handling. Here I will just uh, digress and tell you, which I will talk about later if time permits. You know, IEA does not depend only on what you tell them. Like India will tell them that, okay, so and say. They also have divisions to look for satellite images, you know. Look for other indicators to make a conclusion of their own. There have been papers in the literature where they have tried to estimate the size of a reactor which has not been declared for obvious reasons. It's a country not under comprehensive safeguards agreement. Based on the dome size, they have back calculated what is the capacity of this plant. Similarly, they go by the height of the stack and back calculate what could be the uh, storage capacity. Here, if I may add, I also remember one incident where there were uh, where is the delegation to a particular facility not under safeguard. The first thing that the visitor wanted to see was to have a look at the crane and see the capacity rating of the crane, which was unfortunately displayed on the crane. From there, they back calculated what is the maximum size of the cast and how much spent fuel in single transportation is being carried out. So what I'm trying to say is that the IA inspectorate also looks for, these are known as the uh, information from open sources. Do that. Now, the cameras which are used, they are pan, tilt, zoom, still cameras, motion detection, night vision, underwater, radiation resistant, and infrared. This is how the cameras look like. This is the view of, once again, of the spent fuel pool. There are underwater cameras to keep track of that there is no movement of the spent fuel in the spent fuel bay. Now, portal monitors. Personal or vehicle, they are used for personal or vehicle surveillance. Technological measures are turnstiles, bollards, tire busters, or vehicle movement. Administrative measures are tracking of specific personal or vehicle and subsequent cancellation, suspension of entry permit. Of particular importance are the portals at emergency exits, which have the conflicting requirement of rapid evacuation in case of an emergency, and this could adversely affect this. I will talk about safety, security, and safeguard how they work together and how we have to pick it. This particular portion I will explain later. Now, this is how the portal monitors look like and this is how the vehicle uh, transport monitors portals look like. Now, second thing, let us come to, we talked about the cameras. There is that, that, that is a surveillance system. Now, there are also containment systems. These are called the seals. There could be paper seals, tape seals, metallic, ultrasonic, electronic and optoelectrical. Now, where are they used? Containers, bins, doors, wall shipping, plus train travel, train. I will just try to show you. See, this is a this is a seal of a very high security. This is used for where you are using and storing the, let us say, plutonium oxide or something like that. Now, paper seal is also used. You may be wondering, what will paper seal do? I'll give you an example. You know, when the inspectors come for inspection, during inspection, there is a break, let us say for lunch, they want to go. They have, there's an inspector's room, every facility has given. So what they do is they put a paper tape on it, you know. Even when they're absent for half an hour, one hour, they ensure that nothing is tampered in their uh, absence. There's a term called trust but verify. They will trust what you say, but they will independently verify. So this is how the various seals are looked like. These are the metallic seals. Now, Perimeter protection, though truly speaking, does not fall under the ambit of safeguard, but still, there are double or triple considered offenses with or without electrification, continuously manned watchtowers with the appropriate response force, mobile patrolling dog squads, bollards, type buses, sensors, etc. 
Though perimeter protection is predominantly implemented to address mutual security, it also enhances safeguards as well as safety. Now, this is how the concertina and double concertina fences look like. Now, now let us come to uh, the activities of safeguards in India. Now, IA safeguards were implemented right from the beginning from the TAPS 1 and 2 because these were the reactors imported way back in the late 60s, early 70s. So since I told you that any reactor or any fuel imported has to essentially go under IA safeguard. So the IA, uh, IA safeguards activities started much early in India. Now, the turning point was India's specific safeguards agreement for which I talked about Dr. Grover was the chief negotiator. This has a number, Infor INF CIRC is in IAA parlance stands for information circular. This is information circular 754. This was negotiated with IAA and are unique. Not all facilities in India are covered under IAA safeguards. The facilities offered are the sovereign decision of the country. This is very important. Now, again I talked about subsidy arrangements. Subsidy arrangements are the details of how the, how the uh, agreement will be implemented in a particular country. Now, there is an India's specific additional protocol which is different from what is known as the model additional protocol 540 which is applicable to all CSA countries. Then separation plan implementation, if I remember correctly, by December of 2014, we had to place reactors which under the separation plan, I think the last reactor to go under IA safeguards was Narora Unit 2. So there are, there are a lot of activities take place, you know, when you place a reactor under IA safeguard. Now placing PSWRs under IA safeguard. Now what? India placed operating indigenous PSWRs. Now which one were those? At the time, see we are talking about 2009 when India's specific safeguards agreement was signed and came into force. At that time, RAFs 3 and 4, Kakrapar 1 and 2, and NAPs 1 and 2 were the Indian PHWRs already operating with Indian uranium and they were operating reactors were put under IA safeguards. Offered for safeguards at the time of startup. Now, interestingly, there was reactor CAPS 2 which was retubed, that means pressure tubes were replaced with zirconium niobium. Now, what happens is when you retube the reactor, it is practically new. Just to give you an idea, what is the difficulty and what is the ease in placing a reactor under IA safeguard? I think if I remember correctly, the first fresh uh, reactor that I saw, which went under IA safeguard was RAPS 5 and 6 in 2010, somewhere 9 or 10. So, I told you there are three areas where the nuclear material is tracked. One is the fresh fuel store, then in the reactor and in the spent fuel store. Now, when the fresh reactor goes under safeguard, the fuel is present only at two places. The pole is practically empty because you have not discharged, you have not started the reactor. There is fuel at the fresh fuel stores and there is fuel at the pole. In fact, when the core loading is done, the I remember those 19 pin bundles, they are manually loaded uh, uh, into the reactor because the reactor has yet not operated and there is no background radio radioactivity. And the core map, that means every single bundle that goes into the reactor has its number on the rip, that end plate. It is punched on them. So that is verified against the core map given to the inspectors. They may demand that you take out this particular channel and show us this particular bundle, whether the correct bundle is loaded. So they go to that extent, that is the core verification. And of course, fresh fuel is very easy to uh, verify because it is in a room. They, they can ask for it and it can be handled with the bare hands. Now, what happens when a reactor is operating and you want to, you have placed it under safeguards. Now, it is an operating reactor. Now, let us say reactor is operating, the PHWR is operating and you decide that today is a cutoff date we are placing under IA safeguards. <coughs> Obviously, there will be fuel in the core because it's an operating reactor. And probably a day or two before because daily you are uh, refueling the reactor. Some bundles will be in the pool also and fresh fuel will be there. So, what they do is they this, is, this was specifically done for India. I don't think there is any other known case of any other reactor under operation being placed under IA safeguard. So what they do is, along with the operators, they say that, okay, as per your operation and the reactor physicist, now which are the likely channels you will be defueling tomorrow? 
they ask for about 12 channels which have to be in the next day. In the middle of the night at 12 o'clock, the inspector will say that we want to inspect channel number, let us say N10 or whatever it is. So what happens at that point of time? They come to the site. They, there are three things. One is known as the bundle uh, uh, core discharge monitor. Immediately outside the end sheet of the reactor, there are monitors which are placed by IAEA. Moment a fresh fuel comes out of it, there is a count, you can make out, there is a counter that says that one bundle, two bundle or twelve bundle shift has taken place. There first place is that. Second is the bundle, trans, uh, trans, it, trans, it is transferred from the core to the spent fuel through what is known as a spent fuel transfer duct, SFTD. They have a bundle counter there also placed. So when the bundle passes that SFTD, it counts that the bundle has come. Now let me tell you something very interesting. This happened in one of the operating reactors. The inspector wanted to see the full route of the SFTD and to see whether there are any extra openings. I said, why are, what are you looking for? He says that we want to ensure that the country does not, deep, the, does not divert even irritated fuel. I said, but then who will dare to even touch a, a, a nuclear a irritated fuel? He said, there are suicide bombers or suicide people given for a money, they may do that. So he ensured the entire route right up to the spent fuel uh, bay. And when the bundle comes to the spent fuel bay, the first thing that they do is underwater radiation resistant camera. They read the particular number on the end plate and they correlate with what you have declared and what you have discharged. So this is perhaps for the first time it was done in India. This is how a operating reactor was put under safeguards and a retube reactor is very simple. Since it is retube, there is no background radiation. It is like a fresh reactor. Only thing is that in some cases there may be some, not many, a few uh, bundles inside the spin. The reactor stacks 1 and 2 and uh, uh, couldn't column 1 and 2. In fact, it should also read 3, 4, 5 and 6. Now even reactors 5 and 6 have been placed under IA safeguards. And hence are essentially under IA safeguards. Now, if any of you want to check up at any point of time, that what are the facilities or storage facilities under IA safeguard? This is taken from the net. You have to search for I INF CIRC Information Circular 754 <coughs> Addendum, the latest addendum. So you can see the uh, after the new safeguards agreement, comprehensive uh, that uh, safeguards agreement was signed and came into force on 16th October 2009. These are the facilities which have been placed under IA safeguard. One minute, there is one more slide. So this is a, as of 19th October 2021. So caps 3 and 4 is under IA safeguards. RAP 7 and 8 is also been uh, notified. PSWR fuel fabrication facility, that is the new fuel fabrication facility at Kota, that is also under IA safeguards. And I think the last reactor to be placed under IA safeguards is KKNPP on 19th October 21. So you remember, they can be placed in under IA safeguard even before the nuclear material arrives. But essentially, nuclear material can arrive at a facility only after it has been placed under IA safeguard. So you can, from time to time, you can keep on checking this list to know as of date which are the nuclear facilities <coughs> India has placed under IA safeguards. Now, uh, repeating those things, placing RAPs 3 and 4, NAPs 1 and 2 under IA safeguard. These were the operating PHWR. See, what are the, what are the, Procedures you have to make design information questionnaire, design information verification. Then I talked about fresh fuel code verification, fresh fuel, and other safeguards mentioned. Similarly, Katra Part 2, which was a retube reactor. Now, this is very important. Yes? Why did the, see, we are using in caps 1 and 2 and caps 1 and 2 material, nuclear material from outside, fuel. Hmm. Why other facilities should be under IA safeguard? No, we have placed these facilities. See, Why? this, this, this is a, an answer which probably Dr. Chidabram and Dr. Grover can give. This has been well negotiated separation plan with, uh, uh, under which the decision has been, it's a sovereign decision. Like for example, tax 3 and 4 is not under IA safeguard. Max 3 and uh, 1 and 2 is not under IA safeguard. Probably just to give you an answer, it comes, comes down from the nuclear security of the country. Uh, I think the short answer is that we don't have enough domestic uranium to fuel those reactors, all the reactors. So some of it, uh, to get import uranium, we have to put some facilities under the same. 
Oh. And you cannot put all your facilities under safeguard because then you cannot touch the spent fuel. Right. <laughs> now, sir, why do we put the uh, sorry? Ah, yes. Uh, why do we put uh, the equipment under safeguard? Because in the first uh, one of the slides in the flowchart we told that testing, delivery mechanism, and nuclear material was there. You see, no equipment was there. You, you see, a circle was a nuclear material. Yeah. See, IAE is tracking nuclear material. When it gives you a report, it does not talk about the equipment or other things. For that matter, even heavy water, which is stated as a non-nuclear material, it is it, they don't verify or they, it is only reported quantities. What we tell them, they just report back. They don't physically check whether you have so much. Now, this is very important. India has nuclear facilities like reactors, reprocessing plants, fuel fabrication facilities, all of which are not under IEA safeguards. All such facilities are under Indian system of safeguard, including nuclear material accounting developed indigenously. That is why when you see the uh, title of the talk, it is not nuclear non-proliferation and IA safeguards. It is safeguards because safeguards we talk about two types of safeguards. <coughs> IA safeguards and domestic safeguards. <coughs> now, let me come to, there are two types of facilities, you know, when we talk about. One is known as the bulk handling facility and the item counting facility. Item counting facility like nuclear power reactors. What is the risk? Now, uh, bulk handling facilities, I think I have written somewhere, I don't know where it is missed out, is a facility where the nuclear material is available in the form of either liquid or powder or solution or gas. Whereas item counting facility, like a nuclear reactor, it is encapsulated in the fuel pin, which is then further assembled into an assembly or a bundle like in case of a PHWR. Basically what happens is that, to implement safeguards in an item counting facility is much easier compared to that in a bulk handling facility. Now, I will come to fuel fabrication facilities. Now, there are uh, three types, and, and I have talked about three types of fuel fabrication facilities. Natural uranium based fuel handling in the open. Like you go to uh, NFC, it is natural uranium, it is handled outside in the open. Then plutonium based fuel handled in deep tight glove boxes. This is where I was working in ready metal division in BARC. And thorium based fuels, with, when they will be handled for fuel fabrication in the future, in lean tight shielded hot cells. Uh, this is just a slide which we have made for the thorium fuel cycle. I will skip over it only to tell you that it talks about a reactor, fuel building, assembly plant, reprocessing plant, reconversion laboratory, and other associated facilities. Uh, this is a flow sheet of a powder pellet fuel fabrication plant. This, this one, if I remember correctly, this is for the fuel fabrication plant at Kalpasam for PSPS. Now, just to give you an idea, how does a glove box look like? Unfortunately, I am not uh, allowed, or rather I would not take the liberty of showing you Indian facilities for obvious reasons. But this is how a glove box looks like, you know. See, those are the, uh, it is essentially alpha tight facility and the person puts his hands through these gloves with the additional glove and uh, uh, here you see only two glove boxes but in a uh, fuel fabrication plant there are series of glove boxes because various operations are carried out based on the fuel uh, fabrication flow sheet I show you and that are interconnected. They, they are alpha tight. They are not beta gamma, though in this case there is some, uh, I can see some lead shielding they have provided. <coughs> and this is how a hot cell looks like. This hot cells, you can see what is known as the master slave manipulator. These windows uh, are radiation shielding windows. Those from the processing plant or those who have seen that facility at uh, uh, NFG, they will remember. These walls are roughly about one meter, high density uh, cement concrete. Then uh, there are penetrations for equipment and services to take inside. They are also in series. So this would be similar kind of facility would be used for thorium based fuels. Now, uh, here it is. Fuel cycle facilities, bulk handling. They are conversion plants, enrichment plants, fuel fabrication plants, and fuel reprocessing facilities. Bulk handling facilities, nuclear material in the form of gases, liquids, powders, green pellets, sinted pellets, etc. Uh, just to show you how a how the glove boxes are laid out, you know. The upper one is a linear layout. Uh, 
where what happens is essentially you start from one end and the material is moved from one box to the other manually with the hands. The other one we had proposed where it could be automated and all the glove boxes are put in this manner and there is a central tunnel. Of course, I will not go into the details. This we had used for Kalpakum plant. Now, I will talk about, I told you this is the second part of that talk. I will talk about certain advances. These are basically coming from my team which was working on the design of these two facilities and also something which is taken from the open literature and one of them which is very latest I will talk about it. Now, first one is near real time monitoring dynamic nuclear material accounting. You saw, saw those lines. Basically what you try to do is that first thing that happens when a material, nuclear material enter a box is that there is a load cell. It takes the weight of the nuclear material. Like I told you, when it is plutonium, you have to account for up to a gram and for uranium up to a kg. So the first step is measuring the, the weight. Then of course, there are other uh, uh, measurements which can be done. Then second thing is safeguards by design. What it means is that you provide for pneumat and surveillance system right at the design stage. For example, I'll tell you, when we place reactors 3 and 4 and other reactors under IA safeguards for surveillance systems, especially core discharge monitors and that bundle counter, it is, uh, and those from uh, NPCL will realize, it is a very difficult and task to uh, install anything in a running reactor. You have to take an outage when the reactor is shut down and to route the cabling right from the reactor building up to the control. So if you do the safeguards by design, all these things you can do upfront for whether it is a surveillance system or for uh, uh, other things. So I will not go into the details. What it means is that you provide for all those things right from the beginning. You have the six safeguards by design. There is a uh, uh, term called uh, nuclear safety or uh, uh, nuclear security by design on parallel lines. <coughs> now, co-location, very interesting. I will talk about it when I show you the slide. There is a merit in having pure fabrication plant, reprocessing plant and the reactor in one single location. Why? Because you will not be carrying that nuclear material in the public domain. Once you are not carrying the nuclear material in the public domain, the chances of theft or fire or diversion are minimized. In case of India, the classical would be the Kalpakum facility, FRFCR and the PFBR. I will show you a sketch of that thing. So coal equation helps in uh, plant imagery. Uh, I talked about uh, our sources by which IEA does the imagery by satellite. I will not go into the details. I will only show you one paper. That's the title of the paper. I am not showing the, you the uh, details. It's a paper of 2005. It's, it, it is Satellite Imagery Analysis for Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Automation and Transferability of Image Analysis Procedure for Nuclear Safeguards Related Monitoring Purposes. So this particular thing is being carried out for a very long time. And this is one of the known methods of detecting activities in the Equipment redu reduction. Now you imagine, see, very simple principle of uh, fuel fabrication in a powder pellet type of a facility is that if you have multiple equipment, the chances of powder going and sitting at locations from where it cannot be recovered. There is something which we call buff material unaccounted for. So when you have more uh, equipment, the chances of buff being high is more. There is another implication when the equipment is less, the, the footprint of the plant, and I talked about it later, is smaller. The smaller footprint of the plant means that the area that you have to monitor is small and one of the very big thing contribution, in fact, this was a corollary of what we were doing for the plant. See, in any fuel fabrication facility, especially plutonium handling, the most important thing is the ventilation. It operates under a once through conditioned air, meaning what? That you draw the air from outside, it is filtered, re filter, HEPA filter, it is conditioned, it, then there is a zoning system, and finally it is sent out through the pre filters, HEPA filters, and goes into the stack. Now, pumping a large facility is cost, it is not cost effective. You need, you need to reduce the overall size. And of course, when the overall size of the plant is less, the chances of muff being high is also less. Similarly, ventilation ducting. When we talk about these plants, there is a very long ducting, especially for uh, outlet, uh, exhaust. 
So if the ducting is long, the chances of the nuclear material which has escaped the box settling on the ventilation ducting is high. Automation, this is one of the more most important factors. When you, I have shown you that uh, glove box type of a facility where a person puts its hand and works with the nuclear material. See, when we talk about safeguard, you cannot always say that it is a person who is doing it. It could be the state helping. There are certain states known to be doing uh, diversion. See, if you keep the person away from the nuclear material, the chances of your nuclear material being stolen or diverted come down drastically. Then manpower reduction, obviously, suppose a facility needs only 10 people, why would you like to have 20 people and take the risk of additional 10 people who may turn out to be rogues? Then integration of equipment, this is what in uh, my team worked on it. See now, there are various uh, fabrication process like you take two powders, like UO2 and PUO2, you have to mix, dose them in a particular weight, then you have to mix them, you have to pre-mix them, you have to granulate them. When you do this in different boxes and different equipments, you are obviously scattering your nuclear material at various places. What they have done is they have made one single vertical dosing system where the two powders are fed from the top, then there is a pre-compaction, pre-mixing, mixing, and then it goes to subsequent stages. So this integration of equipment was also done for the FFP plant. Of course, ventilation duction. Uh, oh no, uh, I will not go into detail this thing. Vedya Sab is here, so I will just uh, take his, uh, uh, just make a mention. See, quality control of this fuel is done at various stages, right from the powder stage, then it is pellet, then it is the pin and the assemblies. At every stage, you need to either take out the powder or the pellet or pin for whether it is radiography, chemical composition, physical composition. So what is done is that rather than taking this out of the box and then carrying out this measurement, you integrate the quality control boxes also along with these lines, you know, so that the material does not leave the train of glove boxes. Of course, uh, I will talk about powder reduction. See, there is a process called centerless grinding of fuel pellets, especially after they are finally sintered, they are centerless grinded for uh, grinding them down to the correct size a lot of powder is generated and this powder is one, it falls down in the box. It is nuclear material and by the way it is highly corrosive also. In Tarapur uh, plants they develop methods right at the place where the grinder is there, they suck that powder right up front, pass it through two filters, collect that powder. So what happens is that one is that you are reducing the powder load on the glove boxes, second is you are not allowing that material to go as much. Okay, isolation of services, I will show you this diagram. Drone monitoring, this is the latest after this paper was published or this work was done. These days people talk a lot about drones and drones will come in handy both for indoor monitoring as well as outdoor monitoring of facilities. Then integration of security, safety and safeguards, I will talk about this thing and remote monitoring. This is remote monitoring, what happens is, you know, there are certain uh, facilities or rather location outside facilities where Nuclear material is kept and nothing happens. It is just stored there. So IA has placed its seals. They have implemented remote monitoring by what happens is that the data on seals, that means the seal is not broken and that the data transmission system is healthy, is regularly transmitted to IA headquarters. Sir, yes? But sir, drone monitoring is allowed in nuclear facilities. See, if I am doing my own facility, right? I am putting surveillance cameras. Only thing is, I am putting the camera on a drone now. <coughs> I am talking about domestic safeguards. We have not yet come to a point where IA will be implementing safeguards. Now, this is what a remote, a remote monitoring does. I want to show you this slide. I have put the reference because this is an artist impression of FRFCF. That is a fast reactor fuel cycle facilities. Uh, I have a separate, but I did not want to put it. So now what you see here, those of you who uh, recollect, this canal is Buckingham Canal, that is the seaside, this is the Kalpakam facility. And slightly where you see that end, towards the left is the PFBR coming up. Now there are two things I want to show here, co-location. That reactor you don't see here, but reactor is very close by. And this is within the fence of IG car. Now, 
you see this triangle here and you see the bigger uh, rectangle there in the bigger rectangle you have a reprocessing plant you have a fuel fabrication plant you have a core sub assembly plant and here you have only the services now what happens is the nuclear material is only restricted to that rectangle now people come in for maintenance they are not allowed to move those people who are not required to go in this place need not go only those people who are required to uh, be in the service area need to be here so this isolation of services helps a lot i i i will tell you another example you know this is practical which i have seen it came to my mind only recently we have not published it now see imagine this room this room has a false ceiling and this glove box strain is maintained here any glove box facility that you see has roughly six services which are required including in a uh, ventilation uh, inlet ventilation exhaust water cover gas so many six total six services are required now what happens there is a facility where the glove boxes are placed like this there is a mezzanine uh, there, there is a false ceiling now suppose some maintenance is required the person who comes inside and that does the maintain maintenance by using the uh, the ladders but there is also a facility in our country including ffp what we have done is we have done away with the false ceiling manjanda sir will recollect in uh, see and replaced it with a cement concrete mezzanine now what happens is that if there is a maintenance to be done that person does not come here he goes on top of that mezzanine and uh, uh, does the maintenance so essentially you are keeping those maintenance people away from where you have the nuclear once again pneumatic at reactor say generally three material balance areas fuel fresh fuel source reactor force then fuel batch fueling is verification during refueling and on line i talked about this thing here let me tell you we or uh, when we implemented domestic safeguards at pfpr in place of three we have four material balance area in case of pfpr after the fuel is irradiated it goes into what is known as a in vessel cooling though there is no uh, though there is no irradiation going on there the nuclear material sits in the in within the vessel in the core so that becomes the fourth material balance area because there is a movement between this area now of course these are supplemented by containment and surveillance measures now let me talk this is uh, i will just uh, most of you know but i will for the sake of completion i will tell you there is a subtle difference between nuclear safety nuclear security and nuclear safeguards as dr grover always would tell ki agar if you translate it in hindi it is all suraksha right <laughs> it is everything that boils down to suraksha whether it is safety security safeguards but there is a difference let us come to it one by one nuclear safety is the achievement of proper operating conditions prevention of accidents or mitigation of accident consequences resulting in protection of workers the public and the environment from undue radiation hazards this this covers not only nuclear material this also covers radioactive material now nuclear security is the prevention and detection of and response to theft sabotage unauthorized access illegal transfer or other malicious acts involving nuclear materials other radioactive substances or other at uh, their facilities this covers nuclear material radioactive material and facilities and this talks about the acts of uh, terrorism or uh, whereas safeguards of course it is ia safeguards i would like to say only safeguards so ia safeguards are a set of technical measures that allow the iea to independently verify a state's legal commitment not to divert nuclear material from peaceful nuclear activities to nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices this is the subtle difference between safety security and safeguards so let me explain like uh, so let me give you an example let us say there is a transport of nuclear material by road let us say we have a spent fuel which is being transported by road now safety concern is if the nuclear material is damaged by accident or drop in a water body due to an accident obviously if it leaks out there is a safety concern now security concern is if acts of terrorism are committed by attacking the transport and safeguard says that concern if the material is lost due to accident including fire now practically what has happened is this question i had asked in level writing in iia in fukushima now safety concern is that due to release of radioactivity in air and water that is a safety concern 
Now there could be security concern if some rogue element used that opportunity to steal nuclear material, especially from the fresh fuel stores. It is something like our BWR type of reactor. So this concern was also genuine. Whether it has been addressed or not, I do not have the answer. And the third one, obviously, safeguards concern because that is a comprehensive safeguards agreement, and all material under uh, under the country would be accounted for. Now, once the material has actually blown and turned into gas, I asked Neville Whiting, "How will you account for it?" This was 2011, immediately after the accident. He says, "We are working on it." I <laughs> so and and. I have not listed the same the same concern could be in Ukraine as of today. All three. Now let me very briefly come to the last part. See how the safeguards uh, they appear in international agreements. See, uh, Dr. Gover is a pioneer here. Dr. Chidambaram, of course, no. In every safeguards agreement that uh, for nuclear cooperation that we negotiate and sign with any country, there are various, various articles and there is an article on nuclear safeguards. Details of the methodologies of implementation of safeguards are incorporated in administrative arrangement. There is an arrangement, there is an agreement, one lower to the uh, uh, cooperation agreement that is called the administrative arrangement where the details are given how the reporting on nuclear material will be done and of course very nicely negotiated with IAEA. This was point of negotiation with many countries. They wanted a bilateral agreement. That means, let us say, if you are doing it with country X, they want that. You tell us that what you have transferred on an annual basis. I think we decided that we will not give you anything. What we have submitted to IAEA, we will share that particular in a particular format. And I think this was very hard fought and ultimately probably agreed by all countries. I will come to one specific example. See, when we do these agreements, even for our understanding, which is not difficult. So this was for the understanding of our, uh, how do I put it, uh, our political leadership. And also some of us, there was, when we were uh, negotiating with the Japan, they were very particular about tracking and tracking of nuclear material. You have grain coming in from customer X, customer Y, customer Z. It goes to the floor mill and what comes out of it, you, you cannot specifically say that, okay, this sack has come from customer A, this sack has come from customer B. So this was the first slide. Of course, I have removed the other caption. But what we made from this was, this was for our understanding and also for the understanding of our political leadership that why is it difficult. So what we did was, we went into various agreements that we had done, that Dr. Grover had negotiated. Now, what happens if there is a domestic reactors like for example RAPS 3 and 4 which you place under IA safeguard. Now this is roughly how it goes in the thermal fuel uh, cycle, there is the fast reactor fuel cycle and the thorium fuel cycle. So this term is known as flagging and termination. That means if we are putting any reactor that is Rajasthan 3, Narva and all this and using let us say uranium coming from Kazakhstan or something, as per the agreement with those countries and as per the termination clause on those agreements, there is no obligation to tell them what happens, where it goes and what will be terminated. Now, this is in case of France and Russia. They have no obligation in case of termination or tracking of material. Now, what Japan was trying to ask us, they wanted to know that once we give you the material, uh, they were not giving uranium, they were giving a reactor and a, a pressure vessel. They say after that, what goes through our reactor and where it goes, you have to tell us. So we made a kind of a diagram to make our people understand that if we agree to the termination clause that Japan was talking about, this is what we are going to land up in. They were convinced and I think finally at a very high level, we did not agree to this clause. Of course, this uh, US impact in case of uh, suspension of reprocessing, only I think the material which is stored will have some implication. So now let me come to the very, very last thing, you know, the latest in uh, talk in town is the small and modern. Now, small and modular reactors, here I will refer, I'm coming to the last slide. 
A study was made, I think Dr. Brewer had requested, I think along with him, we did this study. A study was made for thorium fuel cycle comparing hub and spoke, spoke and Intel integrated facility. Now what is hub and spoke? Fuel reprocessing, fuel fabrication and refabrication at one single site like you saw at the FRFCF. All those facilities are at one site including the reactor. Now what happens is fuel transport to and from the reactor site in public domain like NFC also. NFC is the hub and the reactors are the spokes. Other thing is, sorry, I talked about integrated there. Integrated fuel cycle, reactors, fuel reprocessing, etc. all are at one site, like PFR. Now, when you talk about small and modular reactors, they will essentially be deployed in the form of hub and spoke. You don't expect that SMR will be deployed where you also have a reprocessing plant and you also have a fabrication plant. Of course, I think this also has implications from arrangements and procedures. So now, so SMRs will essentially be deployed in hub and spoke configuration. Now, this we had done for thorium. So SMRs will look like this. This could be replaced with the centralized storage or reprocessing plant or fabrication, whatever it is. The reactors will be at various places. Now, what are the implications? The nuclear material safety and security during severe external events, like earthquakes and all that, of course, this is a safety concern and the security and safety and safeguards also during transport of both fresh fuel and spent fuel in the public domain. Because when you place these reactors all over the country, you will be moving both fresh fuel and the spent fuel in the public domain. Now, the another concern, I was just talking to Dr. Grover about it, that these reactors are, will be talking fuel in the range of about 20%, close to 20% of enrichment, whereas other reactors don't go below, beyond three or four. When the enrichment is so high, as per the requirement of significant quantity, the visit of the IEA inspectors to the facility will be more frequent. Meaning what? The load on the safeguards inspectorate and their funding will have to be tremendously increased. Of course, this is also a message to youngsters. If they want, they can take up safeguards as a... No, I'm not joking, you know. They can take it up as a carrier because one of these reactors are going or even other reactors. You have seen, I showed you that... I don't see any youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm saying, this is, this, is the, this is the concern in case of SMRs. I think I have... Okay, let me talk about two books. This one uh, is with Dr. Kakurkar. Fire and Fury, there are three chapters, Cochrane 1, Cochrane 2, say one civil nuclear cooperation. I suggest even if you don't buy the book or get it, you read this chapter, you will come to know what are the nuances, you know, how it happened, Dr. Gover is party, Dr. Chirabram is also party. And you can also read about it in his book, where in that chapter on scientist and a diplomat, you know. I have not talked about CTBT and other thing. There is a lot of discussion about CTBT, how he uh, safeguarded the interest of the country. I think that's all. Just for completion, to tell you NPT, the Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, formerly known as NPT, is an international treaty whose objective is to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapons technology, to provide cooperation in the peaceful resistance of nuclear energy and to further the goal of achieving nuclear disarmament and general and complete disarmament. Nuclear weapon states built and tested nuclear device before 1967, January. This is the cutoff date. Before this date, anybody who has built and tested is a nuclear weapon state under NPT. So I complete with this.